Dr. J.P. Shah, MD, is a senior staff physiatrist in the Rehabilitation Medicine Department at the Clinical Centre of the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. He has received training in medical acupuncture at the UCLA School of Medicine and has been an instructor in medical acupuncture courses at Harvard Medical School and New York Medical College. He also completed a Brave Well Fellowship at the Arizona Center for Integrated Medicine. His clinical research interests include investigating the pathophysiology of myofascial pain, as well as applying integrative approaches to the evaluation and management of neuromusculoskeletal pain and dysfunction. He lectures internationally on the mechanisms of chronic pain, myofascial pain, and treatment approaches, including acupuncture techniques and dry needling. He also teaches state-of-the-art workshops for physicians, dentists and physiotherapists in which he integrates emerging knowledge from the basic and clinical pain sciences in order to improve participants' evaluation and management approaches to chronic pain and dysfunction. He is widely published. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes? yes? If you want to hear me, right? <laughs> All right. Thanks for also, thanks for coming so quickly after the break. This is great. We're all ready to go. I woke up this morning. I flew in yesterday morning. I woke up in my alarm on my Blackberry. I didn't know where I was. And I looked out the window and said, ah, it's beautiful. English <laughs> countryside. Well, thank, thank you for it. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, if you could turn these uh, front lights way, way down, that would be great. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a physiatrist. Uh, this is a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. And I've been working at the clinical center at the NIH for the last uh, 18 years. It's the only job I've ever held. And I think after you hear me over the course of two days, you'll, you won't be surprised as to why I'm still working there, why I enjoy what I do um, um, uh, in my, my position there. So the other thing I want to tell you about myself is um, I'm a clinician, just like I think almost everyone else in this room. But working at a facility like the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest biomedical research hospital in the US, gives us the opportunity to try to answer questions that are so pertinent to, in, in my interest, chronic pain, particularly myofascial pain. So um, I come at this as a clinician, as do most of you, or all of you, and that's what you will hopefully see how some of our questions are being uh, formed and formulated. The second thing I wanted to tell you about myself is that I became interested in this uh, starting out of a personal pain experience after a relatively minor musculoskeletal injury in the lower extremity, which then perpetuated, developed both peripheral and central sensitization, and it really uh, developed sort of a life of its own. And it got me very interested in looking at mechanisms of pain, uh, concepts of sensitization, both peripheral and central, the role of trigger points, the role of modalities such as manual therapies, acupuncture, etc. So um, that's also how I've been informed is, uh, in terms of my own personal experience. And what I have to say is I like to use a lot of animations and videos in my lectures. I am a very visual person and I learn visually and, and I also like to lecture and, and teach visually. And so um, I'm going to take you into the Matrix today. How many of you have seen the movie Matrix? <laughs> yes, yes. It's been out for a long time. Now, it's only the first one that really is the best one, right? That's the one that really got me thinking. And every time it's on television, I just stop and watch. <laughs> so we're going to take you into the Matrix, if you will, of soft tissue pain. Uh, we're going to concentrate today on the biochemical. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about the imaging side of it, but we're going to talk more about the biochemical today. So um, I have nothing to dis disclose um, except that I'm a big movie buff. And it's not just The Matrix. It's not just The Matrix. Um, and there's many, many different movies that I like. And every once in a while, if I'm giving a lecture or someone asks me a question, and if I think of a, of a scene from a movie or a line from a movie, I'll often go off on that tangent. So if I do that, please electroshock me back and tell me where I am, and I'll try to answer your question. But um, all joking aside, um, uh, as you'll see, I like to use a lot of um, relevant um, um, uh, images and, and whatnot from, from movies and things like that, just to sort of make some points, especially The Matrix. So I also would like to thank uh, Mary and Dan, who invited me uh, quite some months ago. And I said, oh, I would love to come. And I said, the opportunity to lecture with with Halim Langevin, Vital Napadil, and everyone else in the panel was just it was too great to pass up. As soon as she invited me, I said, yes, I will be there. So thank you very much, uh, AACP, for the invitation to be here. 
So let me tell you where I'm from exactly, uh, across the pond, as you say, um, on the uh, eastern uh, United States, um, in Bethesda, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. And if you look a little bit closer, as you can see, we're about 240 miles from uh, uh, New York City, and going even closer, uh, that is my office right there. <laughs> so I'm taking you all the way back. I told you I'm taking you to the Matrix today, right? So, um, now, this is, the, this is the brand new clinical research center. This is the older building in the back. And the exciting thing about the clinical center is that we, what we have are inpatient and outpatient care units in close juxtaposition to laboratories. So get, getting, to, getting to work with you know, these extremely bright and ever, ever younger PhDs uh, and students, <laughs> um, and to be able to try to integrate it, right, if you will, look at bench to bedside with bedside to bench type of research, because that's what's so relevant and important for those of us who are dealing with chronic musculoskeletal pain on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the reasons I'm still working there, I love what I do, is because one of the things that we've been able to do was to develop and, uh, uh, and fabricate and utilize a novel microdialysis sampling technique, which is the size of an acupuncture needle. And with this particular needle, we're able to go in and actually measure the biochemical concentration of a variety of things like inflammatory mediators, neuropeptides, cytokines, etc. Substances that we know are associated with persistent pain, inflammation, and sensitization. So this has been really exciting. It's giving us a window, if you will, into the, 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 the local milieu of trigger point tissue and non-trigger point tissue. And we're seeing some pretty interesting differences. In the last couple of years, we've been using uh, uh, sonal elastography, a, a form of ultrasound, to actually visualize the trigger point and look at the stiffness properties of the trigger point, measure them now. Um, so, you know, in traditional ultrasound, you have been able to see, of course, this uh, hypoechoic area, but you're never quite sure if this is fluid, if it's fat. But if the trigger point is stiffer, and we certainly think it is stiffer on physical exam, when you pass vibration through the tissue, what happens is the area of the nodule vibrates with a lower amplitude, and you can actually pick that up with what's called uh, the color variance. And uh, again, working with these engineers, we're now being able to quantify the stiffness of the tissue compared to the surrounding tissue. So this is really an important uh, step, I, I think, in terms of really trying to understand uh, the, the physical findings as well as understanding more about the tissue properties. And we're also looking at imaging blood flow around the trigger point and seeing some very interesting results that I will uh, share with you tomorrow, which fit together with Simon's uh, integrated uh, hypothesis. But as I said, I'm a clinician first and foremost, and I teach, uh, I was trained in uh, medical acupuncture through the UCLA course, which is offered for physicians in, uh, in California. And I teach, uh, I taught in the, in the course up in Boston, which is where uh, Helene also teaches, which is run by Joseph Audet, which is an excellent course um, on structural acupuncture. So uh, I always like to use quotes because I think it helps to ground us as to where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Well, it was Voltaire who said, doctors pour drugs of which they know little, for diseases of which they know less, into patients of which they know nothing. <laughs> so I think you would agree that we've come a long way since Voltaire's day, no, no doubt about that, particularly in many types of internal medicine conditions. But let's, let's be real, folks. I think when it comes to properly evaluating and treating chronic pain, we've got a long way to go. And I think the numbers certainly uh, 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 allude to that in terms of the number of people who are suffering with chronic pain, as well as the cost uh, to society. Um, those of the, our colleagues from the Northeast, Helene, do you know, do you recognize this is? This is a, what's called Good Samaritan or Ether Monument, the Boston Public Garden. I know it's not exactly, but since you're in New England, yeah. but you might know. This is the, it's called the Ether Monument, and it was built because, in, do, do, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in 1846 at Massachusetts General Hospital was the first time that ether had ever been used to uh, uh, sedate a patient and allow the patient to undergo a surgical procedure. So the good people of Boston, uh, uh, as, a, as a testament to that, uh, and, and gratitude, erected this monument. And if you look closely, it says on one side to commemorate the discovery that the inhaling of ether causes insensibility to pain, first proved to the world at the Masters General Hospital in Boston, and this was in 1846. And here is a, a rendering um, of that, uh, of what occurred. Um, this is a, a dentist who's applying uh, the ether to the patient. And this is, uh, I think this was the dean of the, uh, the medical school who was excising uh, a tumor from the patient's neck. And the patient was asked after he, because he was asleep, after he woke up, so tell me, what do you feel? And he said, feels as, as if my neck's been scratched. 
That's all. So, and then the doctor turned to the, the audience, the, the, the amphitheater, and he said, gentlemen, this is no humbug. <laughs> and the reason he said that is because a year before that, in the same amphitheater, a different physician had tried to use um, uh, nitric oxide gas, and the patient woke up in excruciating pain. And the, all the doctors in the audience just, you know, were hurling ex expletives and saying, humbug, humbug. So he turned and said, this is no humbug in the audience. In this case, raised their hands and clapped. Okay, so it was, it was really nice. Now, let's go back to that statue. Look what it says on the other side of the statue. Neither shall there be any more pain. Neither shall there be any more pain. I must have missed something. <laughs> that's why all of us are here, right? So, so one thing as well, just to take, take a look at the numbers. I mean, in the U.S., 25 to 50 percent of people have a chronic regional pain problem. 10 percent have chronic widespread pain. 61 billion dollars in the U.S. In, is the cost and lost productivity in Europe. 20 percent of people have chronic pain, and in the U.K., 1.8 billion dollars uh, was spent in direct care costs for back pain. So clearly. Uh, there's, uh, you know, we, 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 while we make progress when it comes to treating and sedating patients and treating acute pain, chronic pain is an entirely different beast, uh, as, as, you, as you all well know. So when it comes to chronic pain and suffering, I think it's very fair to say that most of our patients literally feel trapped. And, you know, it behooves those of us who are clinicians to try to do um, the best we can in terms of identifying the individual mechanisms of pain that are operant in that patient when they are in your uh, examination room. So the goals of my discussion for the first part of my talk are to really show you the failures of the traditional categorization of pain states, which unfortunately is the medical model. Um, analyze the dynamic relationship between primary after and nociceptors and surrounding tissues and the concepts of peripheral sensitization. Uh, demonstrate that biochemical activation of nociceptors is a very powerful contributor to peripheral and then in turn central sensitization. Uh, discuss the role of neurogenic inflammation in peripheral sensitization, and then show you that once you have these peripheral nociceptive events coming and turned on, it is what's called leads to afferent drive, or literally the impulses per second pounding the dorsal horn, leading to the development of central sensitization, which is clearly the hallmark in chronic pain. So one of the things I like to do is just make sure we're very clear on terms. This is a very astute audience, so, uh, but I'll just quickly go through this. Um, of course, nociception right, is a mechanical event in which um, action potentials are fired right, off of nociceptors. And initially, you may only perceive crude touch when you achieve a certain um, uh, a level of frequency, and you might perceive pain. Now, pain is entirely subjective, right? You may have nociception without pain, and you can have pain also without nociception. So I'm going to run this video, and I'd like to ask you a question. How many of you think, sorry guys, <laughs> how many of you think that there's no susceptive event going on right here? How many of you say there's no susceptive? Someone answer, because I want to keep running the video. <laughs> no one thinks there's no susceptive here? Yes, okay, all right, good. Now, how many of you think this person is experiencing pain? It depends, right? Doesn't it depend? What if this is Tim, Tim Henneman at Wimbledon final, right? I know, I know the story, guys. He's right, he comes, he comes ever so, achingly so close, right, many, many years, and doesn't quite win the, the tournament or get close enough to the final. But clearly, pain de develops, it depends on a number of different things, of course, one of which is the context of the situation. If this is a weekend warrior, twists his ankle, yes, it's going to be extremely painful, but there may be situations where in the height of intense competition, or certainly on the battlefield, you know, uh, soldiers have had, had horrific wounds, haven't felt pain for some period of time um, after the injury. So just to distinguish between the nociception uh, and pain, of course. So this pain matrix is clearly multidimensional. 